about six years ago, we held a citizen's jury. That is, we brought together a number of people from off the street almost, who had no vested interest in medicine and no involvement in the health service. And we put to them the question, my health, whose responsibility? And we talked about healthy behaviours, we told them the results of healthy behaviours, and we started to talk about drugs that protect health. Now that's an important difference from treatment. And we uh, uh, talked about aspirin in the prevention of heart attacks. Well, the uh, jurors, the 16 jurors in that study, wrote a report, and one of the items in the report was that they wanted the medical profession to involve them in discussions about advances in prevention. They said, prevention is our responsibility. But you do the trials, you get the results, and you discuss them amongst yourselves. We would like to be involved in that discussion, and hence this series of talks. So we're here today to respond to the call from a Welsh citizen's jury to put balanced information on aspirin into the public domain, and we'll include in our discussions aspirin and vascular disease, aspirin and cancer, the undesirable effects of aspirin, and also the benefit-risk balance of aspirin. Peter, what is the evidence that aspirin reduces the risk of heart attack and stroke? Well, our study was really very exciting. We asked the men in our trial to take the tablets for two years. And at the end of two years, there was a 25% reduction in the number of further heart attacks. Now, that today would not uh, raise eyebrows, but in those days, 1974, we published our paper. It caused tremendous interest. I was flown across the Atlantic to present the results in America. Now, that was only one trial. And in scientific research, we're always worried about chance. Was this a chance effect? Did we happen to put men who had a good outlook, a good prognosis on aspirin and the others on the dummy tablet? No, there have been 140 trials of aspirin across the world. Our trials stimulated enormous interest in aspirin. And now we have absolute confidence that aspirin reduces the risk of a heart attack or, the redu or a stroke, uh, an ischemic stroke, by 20 to 30 percent. Now, it's still marvellous. There are other drugs now, but really aspirin it uh, reduces the risk by a mechanism which is different to most other drugs. And so it can be added to almost any other treatment for a heart attack and will reduce the risk of a heart attack 20 to 30 percent and the same with stroke. And two related questions, Peter. What is the dosage of aspirin and why is it important that people to continue to take the aspirin after a heart attack and stroke? Well, one of the remarkable things about aspirin is it has the effect on the blood and on the clotting mechanism, the thrombosis mechanism, at a very low dose, and there is no advantage in increasing the dose. Now, an ordinary tablet of aspirin is 325 milligrams. The dose that's necessary in prevention is only 100 milligrams or less. That's less than a third of a tablet. And in this country, we have the junior aspirin, and that is adequate, and there is no benefit. In fact, there's harm in an increase in side effects, undesirable side effects, if the dose is increased. Now, the other question you've asked is about continuing aspirin. Again, there's a remarkable effect with aspirin. If aspirin is suddenly stopped, then there is an increase in the risk of a heart attack or a stroke. There have been many studies of this, and they all show that during roughly the first month after stopping aspirin, there is an increase of up. One study shows it as a sevenfold increase. Most of them show a three or four in, uh, fold increase in the risk of a stroke uh, or a heart attack. So if for some reason aspirin has to be stopped, preventive aspirin has to be stopped, then it should be tailed off very gradually to avoid that rebound effect. Peter, there have been reports in the media about aspirin preventing cancer. What do we know? The story of aspirin and cancer goes back quite a long time, actually, because some very early animal studies showed that aspirin prevented the spread of cancer. 
Then an Australian group looked at a cross-sectional study, a longitudinal study, uh, with a very large number of people, and they found that people who were taking aspirin, for whatever reason, had a very low risk of cancer. Now that's all suggestive evidence. We had to have experimental evidence on experiments on people, with some people put on aspirin and some not put on aspirin. That would be very, very difficult. We would need vast, very, very large studies. They would have to go on for a very long time. So the advance was made by a man I think of as a genius in Oxford, Peter Rothwell. He went back to some of the early aspirin trials and he followed up all the patients <clears throat> up to 20 years. Uh, he followed them up and he found that those who had originally been on aspirin, a substantial proportion of them continued to take aspirin. They knew of the benefit. And he compared those with the people in those trials who were not taking aspirin. And he found a remarkable reduction. Overall, there was about a 30% reduction in cancer. Now, this is prevention, this is not treatment. And it was the uh, uh, very, very exciting because in certain cancers, it was even more than that. And the uh, most remarkable cancer was colon, large bowel cancer. The third most common cause of death in cancer, bowel cancer, was reduced by 60%. Now, Peter Rothwell followed up many trials, so it's not we're not just depending on a single trial in this, there are many trials. Nor are we depending on that technique of following up old trials. A man in uh, Newcastle and Tyne, another genius, if I may say so, John Byrne, he took people who have a genetic disposition to cancer. Very sadly, these people with this particular syndrome Many of them get cancer before they're 40. So he put half of the group of those people on aspirin, and an aspirin a day, and they showed the same reduction, particularly again in colorectal cancer, 60% reduction in large bowel cancer. And two related questions, Peter. How long does it take for aspirin to work? And what do we know about how aspirin might be working? Well, one of the predictions that was made on the basis of test tube work, it was predicted that if aspirin had an effect on cancer, it wouldn't show for at least five years and probably 10 years. And that was exactly what Peter Rothwell showed in his follow-up of the people from the early aspirin heart disease trials. There was no evidence of benefit for at least five years. Now, that was predicted on the grounds that if you reduce the risk of a cell becoming cancerous, uh, then it is going to be many years before that cell would have been detected clinically as a lump somewhere in the body. And that period between a cell going cancerous and a lump appearing and being diagnosed by a doctor is about 10 years. So the prediction was fulfilled, and that's part of the uh, evidence in the background establishing the fact that aspirin reduces cancer. And Peter, aspirin is called acetyl salicylate, and salicylate is also present in fruits and vegetables. Is there a relationship between the two? Yes, salicylates are very widely distributed throughout nature. Virtually every plant and every fruit has uh, salicylates. Now that may well be the explanation for the well-known fact that five a day, that fruit and vegetables reduce the risk of cancer. They, it's thought they may have an effect on heart disease, but it's fairly clear they have an effect on cancer. Now, one of the troubles nowadays is that fruit and vegetables are grown in cosseted conditions, in polytunnels, in uh, greenhouses. The salicylates in vegetables bear a very close relationship to the amount of stress that the plant has been exposed to, the number of pests that have attacked it, the amount of heat and cold that it has endured. So now most of our fruit and vegetables have very, very low levels of salicylate. Furthermore, the amount of salicylate you can get from vegetables or from fruit is very low. 
but uh, the amount from a tablet of aspirin, a junior tablet of aspirin, is very much higher than you will ever get from fruit and vegetables. Peter, all medicines carry risks of side effects. What are the risks of aspirin? Well, I think you asked that question in a very clever way. All medicines do have risks, but those risks have to be balanced against the benefit of the drug. Now, with aspirin, the benefits are enormous, a reduction in heart disease, a reduction in stroke, a reduction in cancer. But the risks are important, and particularly as it's a preventive drug. Uh, so we've got to look at them very seriously and treat them very, very carefully. Now, the risk is bleeding with aspirin. Uh, bleeding from the stomach and rarely, fortunately rarely, ble bleeding into the brain and a hemorrhagic stroke. The bleeding in the stomach is increased. Now, that happens to anyone. We've all got a risk of bleeding from the stomach. And the risk is increased by about 50 to 60 percent. Uh, it's not quite doubled uh, in those who are on aspirin. Now, I think it's very important to look at how serious the bleed is. Now, we have done that. My team has done that in very great detail. And we put forward the uh, hypothesis that the most serious bleeds are those that cause death, fatal bleeds. And we have done a very careful analysis of all the literature. And the literature, I can tell you, is vast on aspirin, the benefits, and on the risks of aspirin. And we find convincing evidence that fatal bleeds are not increased. There's no increase in death from bleeding from aspirin. How often do the side effects occur? And if people do experience a side effect, should they automatically stop taking the aspirin? The uh, number of, of, of uh, people who bleed is about one in every thousand. Uh, stomach bleed, one or two in every thousand. But that risk decreases over time. The trials that I've talked about with Peter Rothwell, where he followed up people for 20 years, he found that the risk disappeared after about five years. It's only in the first year or two that there is the increased risk. Now, the natural common sense treatment, if somebody has a risk, the advice is stop the aspirin. But it's been shown in study after study that stopping the aspirin in somebody who's been taking it for a long time will increase the risk of a heart attack or a stroke, a rebound in the risk of a heart attack or a stroke. And that risk can be quite substantial. It was a sevenfold increase in strokes, a fourfold increase in heart attacks in different studies in people who stopped the aspirin. So even if there's a bleed, there is good evidence from a study in Hong Kong where a man with great courage took uh, well over 100 people who had bled and he put half of them back on aspirin and the other half he stopped the aspirin. He gave them all a protective drug, a PPI, a drug that protects the stomach. But half he put back on aspirin, half he did not put back on aspirin. And the number of deaths was remarkably different. There was a highly significant difference. Those put back, back on aspirin had very few deaths. Those who, who the aspirin was stopped because of a bleed, they had quite a high, a 10% mortality, actually 10% of them died, whereas only 2% of the others died. So the answer seems plain. If you're stopping, if you have to stop aspirin for some reason, tail it off very, very gradually. If you have a bleed and somebody says, oh, you should stop the aspirin, ask for a gastroprotective, a stomach protective drug, and continue on the aspirin. The evidence is really quite clear in the literature. To summarize, bleeding from the stomach is a crisis. Uh, suddenly to vomit blood is, is very worrying, and very distressing, but it's uh, not in the end serious and doesn't cause death or any after effects. But the other bleed, from uh, aspirin is into the brain. Now that is serious. Fortunately, it is very rare indeed. The estimate is that one or two people in every 10,000 uh, suffer from a bleed into the brain. Now the main factor in bleeding into the brain, a hemorrhagic stroke, the main factor is blood pressure. And there is evidence, now it's not totally convincing, but there is highly suggestive evidence that if blood pressure is controlled, 
and if there's any evidence of hypertension, if that is adequately treated, then there's no excess bleeding into the brain from aspirin. So anybody going, thinking of going on uh, long-term low-dose aspirin should have their blood pressure checked. And if their blood pressure is adequately treated, uh, then there is no evidence of any increase in bleeding into the brain. So Peter, what do the medical profession make of the benefit-risk balance of aspirin? Well, it's a complex question that because there are different subgroups in the community. People who've had a heart attack or have had a stroke or those who have evidence of heart disease, there's really no question and there's total agreement that they should be on low-dose aspirin uh, daily uh, and for the rest of their lives because that risk continues throughout the rest of their lives. The argument focuses on people who are healthy, older, healthy people, because they're at risk of uh, one or two in every thousand will get a heart attack or a stroke. One or two in every thousand will get a bleed. What's the balance in the numbers? It doesn't make sense to say go on aspirin because of one or two getting a bleed and one or two not getting a heart attack or stroke. But the seriousness of those outcomes is so very different that there's, the uh, evidence should be given to the person and they should be encouraged. You make up your mind. You decide whether that risk is worth taking in order to prevent those very serious conditions. Now that balance has been greatly altered with the new evidence that aspirin also reduces cancer. Because now we've got to look at the risk of one or two in a thousand having a bleed against the reduction in heart attack, in stroke and in cancer. But again, I would say it, it, this is prevention, it's not treatment. And it is the subject, himself or herself, who should be given the evidence and encouraged to make their own decision. So how should individuals weigh up the benefit and risk balance of aspirin? And is there an optimum age at which people should consider starting to take an aspirin? There's a gradient in this. Somebody who has a bad family history and perhaps an uncle or an aunt had cancer, they would be more easily persuaded and rightly to take a protective drug against that. Um, the age is, is also difficult. Um, the risk of cancer goes up very markedly from the age of 50 and heart disease about the same. So really around the age of 50, people should consider, should I go on an aspirin a day to reduce heart attack, stroke and cancer? Some people say no, but cancer takes five years before there's any protection. So perhaps 45 would be a better age. Others say, well, women have lower risks of these conditions. So perhaps 55 for them. I think just as a rough rule of thumb, let's say around 50, people should be given the evidence and encouraged to make up their own decision between the risks and the benefits. Now that has been done professionally and scientifically. And there are three very, very careful evaluations being published in the medical journals. And they have looked at the risk benefit balance and the cost. The cost is of importance, not to the individual, but to the health service. And there is a substantial reduction in cost and a benefit uh, in um, aspirin prophylaxis, preventive aspirin, uh, from about the age of 50. One of the studies looked only at colorectal cancer. Now there is a provision for colorectal cancer throughout the country. There is colorectal screening. And the difficulty, now that's highly effective, uh, reduces the risk of colorectal cancer and death from colorectal cancer very substantially but only 50% of people throughout the country agree to be screened for that. It's not the most pleasant procedure. Well, those people should be told about the benefits of aspirin as an alternative. They should be given the evidence on both preventive measures, screening and a tablet of aspirin a day. Could aspirin play a role in healthy aging? I think it's quite obvious that it will, but let me put it into context. 
Uh, we have made a special study of healthy behaviors, non-smoking, exercise, low BMI, healthy diet, and a low alcohol intake. And those five healthy behaviors are associated uh, in the next uh, 20, 30 years with a very substantial reduction. 50% less um, diabetes, 50% uh, less heart disease and stroke, uh, a small effect on cancer, about 30% reduction in cancer, uh, and 30% uh, reduction in all-cause death. So living healthily is not just a, a discipline, it is a benefit, and a very, very marked benefit. Sadly, only 1% of people in Wales, less than 1% of people, follow all five healthy behaviours. And sadly, only 5% follow four of the healthy behaviours. Now, I think aspirin... Uh, prophylactic aspirin, preventive aspirin, should be seen within that context. And everybody should examine their way of life, their lifestyle, and should examine whether or not they smoke, whether or not their BMI, their body mass index, their body weight is, is desirable, what diet they're having, whether or not they're in, uh, abusing alcohol, and whether or not they take aspirin. It's part of a preventive package. And aspirin should not be seen on its own. Now, the advice that I actually give people, it'd be unrealistic to tell the average man in the street, look, start living a healthy behavior. Here are five things you should be doing. What I challenge people with is go home and make a firm resolve that you're going to pick up one of those healthy behaviors that you haven't been doing. And tomorrow, make the resolve again. And when you slip up in a week's time, make the resolve again and try and work towards a healthy lifestyle. If they did that in Wales, if everyone in Wales took up one more healthy behaviors, uh, behavior, there would be a very massive reduction in the amount of diabetes, in the cost of diabetes to health service, in the cost of heart disease to the community. All of these things would be reduced. Is there a risk that people watching this will take the aspirin as the easy option rather than modify their lifestyle? I would feel very sad, but to be realistic, I think some people will do that. But I would encourage them to look at their lifestyle as well as aspirin taking. Uh, and why not pick up both a healthy behaviour that you're not following now and aspirin daily? Well, I trust you've enjoyed and learnt a lot from this uh, video, but if you want more information, well, do talk to your doctor, but ask your doctor about the things that we have uh, covered in this video. If you do have uh, any symptoms from your stomach, should you go on a drug to protect your stomach as well as the aspirin? If you have any suspicion of blood pressure, check with your doctor what your blood pressure is. And if it's raised, ask, should you go on an antihypertensive drug to bring your blood pressure down? Now, if you want more information than uh, your doctor gives you, well, then we have written out the uh, references to a number of papers in the medical press. And those are available from your local library. And you can look up one of these and read more, much more, about the benefits of aspirin and the risks of aspirin and the balance between those. So thank you very much for watching. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Our very best wishes to you from Gareth and myself. Goodbye.